Hi guys and welcome back to a new video. If you're new here, my name is Lindsay and today I am back with another French case. This one from 2004. I'm quite certain you've never heard of this one before. It did make the national news when it first happened in France. However, I don't believe it got very popular outside of France. This is also my third time filming this video. Um, that's why I'm posting this so late. I've had a few issues with storage space and audio, so here we go. <laughs> I'm ready. Before we get started, just a heads up, if you like this type of content, please remember to like and subscribe. I do apologize for the audio on this video. I'm not quite sure how good it's going to be, but for this video, it is what it is. So I do apologize if it's not great. If you have any suggestions for any other cases, please comment them down below. And without further ado, let's just get started. For this story, I am taking you back to Nayou, which is a small town 30 kilometers south of Toulouse in the south of France. On December 23rd, 2004, police received a phone call from Geneviève Labouisse, who had just found her father dead in a pool of his own blood. Police arrived around 9 p.m. at the residence, and they immediately noticed a car at the gates before the driveway, and the car was still running, the radio was still on, the lights were on, and the front left door was open, so that's the driver's side door in France. Up on the driveway, police noticed the body of Christian Labouisse. He had received a shotgun blast to the head, meaning that he was barely recognizable. However, Geneviève did identify him as her 61-year-old father. Police had a look around and started examining the scene just to see what had happened. They noticed a little bit of leftover ammunition all over the ground and quickly realized that two guns were involved and two very different guns. There was a shotgun as well as a Colt 45, which made police believe that there were two separate shooters because those would be two very awkward guns to carry on your person together. The driver's side window had been completely blasted by the shotgun shot and from the way Christian was found on his driveway as well as the ammunition around, police came up with the following series of events. Christian had just pulled up at his house gate when the attacker came up and shot at him through the driver's side window. Now it's hard to tell if Christian had seen the attacker coming, however, it was already dark. It was, this was just before Christmas time. And it's very possible that Christian never saw the attacker coming. However, it is suggested that once the attacker had shot through the window, Christian tried to defend himself. He had some shotgun blast residue on his left arm, meaning that he had tried to protect himself inside the car and then opened the door and tried to push the attacker away with his foot. Now the attacker tried to shoot him again and aimed for the foot, making his entire shoe explode. So Christian now only had one shoe left, but nothing was gonna stop Christian. He still tried to make his way up to the house. He started running up the driveway when he got shot twice, but this time by a Colt 45. He finally collapsed on the driveway until the attacker came up to him to shoot him in the head with a shotgun. And the shot was less than a meter away from his face with a shotgun that creates a huge blast, which is a really, really horrendous way to shoot someone. But of course, this was the final blow and Christian did not survive. Now, because the final shot was at such close range, it did suggest revenge. It did su suggest an element of um, a personal vendetta against Christian, because who would go to that extent, shoot him so many times to the point where you would shoot someone in the face with a shotgun less than a meter away from the face. Um, police definitely believed that this was a personal revenge story. However, it was also quite a professional trap. There was no way Christian was going to make it out alive. Whoever had done this wanted to catch Christian by surprise and also brought two different guns. So police thought that this could have been a professional job, but then again, a lot of the ammunition was left behind. A lot of the shotgun shells were left behind. Nobody had tried to clear the crime scene or remove any evidence. And police actually found a black glove behind Christian's car. So they took that as evidence. However, they also noticed that there were two intact bullets on the ground. It's possible that whoever was handling the gun wasn't very good at handling guns. It could have been an amateur or it could mean that the gun misfired or there was a defect with the gun. On the following day, December 24th, police looked at the house. They were searching through Christian Labouisse's house 
to see if they could find any information in there because so far they had absolutely no idea who had done this. And they actually found a gun taped under his armchair, which is very unusual. It made police believe that maybe he was prepared for an attack or an invasion or anything like that. It looked like Christian was expecting something and he was prepared because his wife and daughter actually had no idea that there was a gun taped under the armchair. And police also found two more guns throughout the house. Before I talk about the case, I will tell you a little bit more about Christian Labouisse and who he was. I will be referring to him as Christian throughout the case, but people described him as a very rigid guy, very authoritarian, very strict, someone who had very high standards and he held himself to very high standards, but he also had very high expectations of friends and family. One of the words that was used to describe him was uncompromising, and I think that is very fitting given his character. He basically didn't seem like the most like laid back guy to hang out with, but he was also very loyal. At the time of his murder, he lived with his wife Monique and their daughter Geneviève, and unfortunately Geneviève was the one who did find her father in the driveway, and there were no disputes, no recent arguments, no fights, no reason for any of them to fight back. So police had to quickly dismiss them as suspects. However, they tried to figure out who could have done this. So they tried looking into Christian's past. Christian was actually quite famous in the region. He ran two very successful surveillance and security companies. Before starting those businesses, he was a military guy. He joined the military after high school, quickly became a commando, then became a commando instructor. So incredibly high level within the army. And then he moved on to mercenary work before becoming a bodyguard for politicians, high profile celebrities, um, anyone you can think of, he was their bodyguard and he was actually quite, he had a bit of a reputation throughout France. Um, one of the singers he used to bodyguard, is that a word? One, one of the, one of the singers he used to do security for was Michel Jonas, who is a huge singer in France. So this guy wasn't just a nobody. And after a little while, around the age of 50, he started two businesses. And one of them really focused on security for events, huge festivals, anything like that. Um, they used to do security for concerts for Johnny Hallyday. So if you know anything about France, he's pretty much like the Elvis of France. He was one of the biggest superstars. So he did really really big events um, and his companies were very well known throughout France but especially in the Toulouse region. He didn't seem to have any enemies though it is possible that because his companies were so successful he had a couple of people who were jealous or envious of his success but aside from that there were no obvious suspects. In 2002 he actually received the Légion d'honneur which is one of the highest honors you can receive in France for his service and a lot of people saw him as the head honcho of security, the the knight, the modern knight of security and surveillance, like a kind of a kingpin, but a good one. He had an incredible reputation and all the people he worked for had nothing but good things to say about him. Hundreds and hundreds of people showed up for his funeral to the point where the funeral had to be organized like an actual event. And he had politicians, he had singers, Michel Jonas actually said a few words. Um, he had a military funeral, so obviously from his previous career they had the military proceedings for that. And there were quite a few people in the crowd who were kind of standing in the back with some sunglasses on, so quite a few people speculated that this could have been secret agents from when he was working as a mercenary. No one really know, no one really knew what he did between the military and his companies. I think there was a little bit of a gray area there, so a, a few people speculated that these were um, old colleagues, um, secret colleagues from his past who came to pay the respects, but then some people also believe that it could have been security hired for the funeral because it was such a big event, but also due to the circumstances of his death, people wanted to make sure that the funeral itself would be safe. So no one really knew who these people were. However, everyone at the funeral was very suspicious of each other. Now, because nobody knew who had done this or why this was the main theme of the funeral, whoever came up to give a speech or say a few words about Christian would say, you know, who and why? Who, who would do this to him? And who could possibly want something from Christian? 
And police are convinced that the answers are in his past. Because of his military past, his mercenary past, his bodyguard experience, they're convinced that this is some secret agent payback, that maybe he was working for like the French FBI or something like that, and that someone wanted retribution. However, they found absolutely no evidence of that. And they decided to start looking into his business to see if maybe there was a disgruntled employee, maybe someone got paid late, someone got laid off, someone got fired, and someone would have a reason because so far there was no clear motive. Also, I forgot to say the reason police quickly eliminated the professional hitmen route was because it was too much of an amateur job. So if this was from his military past or his mercenary past, surely they would have sent a professional. I'm picturing, you know, a sniper somewhere from far away who could just leave no trace behind. But this was kind of a messy crime scene with quite a lot of evidence left behind. So there was no evidence that this was a professional hit, meaning that this was more personal and probably linked to Christian's professional life or personal life. So as they're looking into the employee lead, um, he had actually between 200 and 300 employees between the two companies, which is actually quite a lot of people. And police obviously did not interview every single one of them, but they actually quickly realized that there was no point. Um, none of the employees had anything bad to say about him. They actually loved working for Christian because he was such a leader. He ran his business like in the army, basically. He just honestly had no time for nonsense. So no one ever got paid late. None of the transactions were suspicious. Um, no one got fired for no reason. The way Christian worked was he was incredibly loyal, so he would stand by you. So as an employee, if someone criticized you or someone made a complaint about you, Christian would actually take your side and he would defend you. However, if you did mess up, then you most likely were in trouble. But because he was such a good boss, everyone wanted to work for him and no one had any complaints. So police had to quickly dismiss this lead. So instead they start looking at the competition because Christian's companies are very successful to the point where competitors are struggling. Even though Christian charges more for his services, competitors have a hard time because everybody wants to use Christian's companies. He has a reputation, he's famous to a certain extent in that industry at least, and people know that they're going to get a good service from him. They can trust him. This is a perfect company. So of course they're going to pay a little bit more just to get his employees to work for them. So police thought maybe a competitor is upset or maybe a company wanted to eliminate the competition. Christian had actually built a bit of an empire in that industry and not just in the Toulouse region, he was known throughout France. And being the man that he was, he decided to introduce a chart. So basically Christian was tired of companies overcharging for similar services. So kind of like scamming their clients but also a lot of companies would pay under the table, hire a couple of bodyguards, but not really declare them, not put them on the tax paperwork. And like Christian had no time for that. He's like, look, my business is run perfectly well and it's very successful. And he wanted everybody else to be held to the same standards. So what he created was a chart, basically introducing this pay scale price range so that all the companies, he wanted to regulate the business basically, all of the companies would pay the same prices for the same services. And a lot of the competing companies are like, whoa, whoa, whoa stay out of this. We'll, we'll do whatever the hell we want, you know? And he was like, well, actually on top of that, let me create a blacklist. So this man created a blacklist, putting all of the companies who did shady work, paid under the table, didn't really declare some of their employees, you know, on tax paperwork, anything like that. So now he sent this long list of companies to like, all the relevant people to be like, well, don't use these companies because they don't run their business um, properly. So obviously all of the companies on that blacklist are like, I can't believe he did this. And police are thinking this is perfect. Someone on that list must be angry enough to want to get back at Christian, of course. So while they're looking at the competitors and sifting through the blacklist, they decide to look into Christian's personal life. And they also try to find out what he was up to the day of his murder. And interesting, and interestingly enough, he had been meeting up with a woman and not just any woman. This was Christian's mistress that he had a daughter with. Now, in Christian's defense, he no longer had a romantic interest in this person. They were just friends, 
but he did have an affair with her around the time he married Monique and had Geneviève and around that time he cheated on her, had a daughter with this lady and they remained friends and he was still involved in his other daughter's life. They were of similar age so both daughters were around the same age and he would, you know, pay for her schooling and financially help them out but he did own up to that mistake um, and Monique and Christian were still together after that so this was early on in the marriage and that affair was over however they were still friends and he had met up with her that day just to catch up and police think like wow this is a bit unusual because you'd think someone who's so strict on all of the rules wouldn't engage in cheating or affairs and he had actually been married before that he got married at 20 years old when he was in the military he got married in 1963 and his first wife and him had a daughter named Patricia and when Patricia was nine years old unfortunately they got into a car crash just Christian and the wife without the daughter and it was a fatal car crash the wife did not survive she died instantly and Christian was so traumatized by it that he never ended up telling Patricia. He basically dropped her off at an aunt's house and just kept living his life with minimal interaction with Patricia. So Patricia, who's nine years old, basically lost both parents in a day with no explanation. So she didn't even know her mother was dead. And she ended up finding out accidentally through a cousin, which would have, must have been just absolutely heartbreaking and traumatic because she thought her parents were still alive they just kind of ditched her but it was even worse now because her mom was dead and her dad wouldn't even spend time with her and it's so brutal but that's not even the worst part two years after the accident that's when christian married monique and then they ended up having Geneviève together but they didn't even invite patricia to the wedding it was almost as if she didn't exist anymore he just kind of gave up on her he just basically lost his wife very suddenly and just couldn't bear to look at their daughter anymore and just started a whole new family started fresh just like that and it must have been so so brutal on patricia and she definitely grew up with quite a lot of issues because of that which anyone would she spent quite a lot of time in a boarding school and then once she graduated she tried to join the military probably just like her father she wanted to follow his career so she didn't last very long, unfortunately. She had some mental health issues and quickly got discharged. And after that, she basically had trouble keeping a job, but she also had very bad relationships. She wasn't with anyone who was good for her, probably because of her upbringing. So she ended up dating quite a few problematic people and police are thinking, perfect, let's look into her because she has the most motive, if that's a saying. And although at the time of Christian's murder, she was in the hospital because of her depression, she was dating a man who had just gotten out of jail for murder. Police are loving this. They're thinking this is perfect. She has a motive. And although she has an alibi, she wasn't anywhere near the crime scene and she was in the hospital. Her current partner just got out of the jail for murder. He must have something to do with this. However, the relationship was too recent. The guy barely even knew uh, anything about Christian. He'd never even met him. So they hadn't been together long enough for the boyfriend to meet her father. And he actually was in a completely different city at the time of the murder. So he was quickly ruled out. So police look back a little bit further to see who she was dating before. And a year prior to that, she had been dating this man called Pompon which literally just means a pom-pom. It's a nickname that's obviously not his real name. And he was a real piece of work. He was the actual worst. She fell madly in love with him and over time realized that he was an absolute piece of crap. And the relationship became increasingly abusive to the point where she had to be hospitalized because of the physical abuse. And the reason police believed that Pompon might have something to do with this was because Christian found out about the physical abuse. And although Christian and Patricia had a very strained relationship, obviously. That was still his daughter. Um, so, and he was still a security guy and a surveillance guy. So he basically sent two guys over to Pompon's place just to kind of like, maybe not teach him a lesson, but more like give him a warning. So they went there to get Patricia out of it basically. And they were mostly there to make sure she got out safely. So they went to pick her up, grab your, like, pack your bags, we're going. And then Pompon's like, um, I don't think so. And then the guys were like, um, meet me in the parking lot. And one of them ended up kind of roughing him up. 
basically saying, hey, don't hit women and don't hit a Christian's daughter, um, move on. And that was that. So police thought, well, perfect. He's pissed off because Christian got involved and he made Patricia leave. And now he no longer had someone to abuse. So that would give him motive. But unfortunately, he was also in a different city. He had a very strong alibi, so it couldn't have been him either. So police were running out of leads. However, she had another ex-partner, so they look into that. And this one, she had been dating for 15 years, very long relationship. And this man was just something else. Police had to look into it because he was such a, a peculiar man. Claude Clément was 56 years old at the time of the murder, and he lived 500 kilometers away from Toulouse. So he lived near Marseille. And he actually was single at the time. He was, I believe, living with his brother. However, they were no longer on speaking terms, so I'm not sure if they were just roommates or he was just crashing there. He didn't really have his own place, but he didn't have a cell phone. He had a landline and would receive like two calls a month on it. And when police made their way to his hometown all the way from Toulouse, he just welcomed them like as if they were local police. He was just like, oh, hey, come on in, have some coffee. Just kind of like a nice hospitable guy. Police described him as like typically Southern. He had the whole outfit, like the little white tank top, wife beater, the little shoes, short guy, just kind of like, um, just like a little old guy, just a little old man who was just happy to have police over and finally happy to have some company. Police also described him as a bit of a simpleton and that those are police's words. They said he was a bit of an oaf, a bit of a simpleton. However, he seemed like a really nice guy. And maybe that's why Pat Patricia spent 15 years with this man is because he was just like a good guy and police look around the house and they're like right what is it about him because the house was immaculate it was so clean but police are looking around it's not like they're searching for anything they just wanted to speak to him but they're looking around the room and they notice shelves and shelves and shelves of cleaning products shampoo bottles anything like that but you know like multiples of them arranged on the shelves with military precision. So they're all lined up like Truman Show type of staging. And they couldn't believe it because what are you doing with all these products? It basically gave vibes of like extreme couponing when people show their shed or their garage and you walk in and it's just rows of products that they'll, they'll never use throughout their lives. But it's just, it was such a good deal. They had like, they paid 50 cents for like 300 bottles of soap. Um, and that, that was, Claude Clément. That's, that's his entire house. And he just seemed to like be obsessed with a bargain. And he started telling police, actually, you know what? I actually, I go dumpster diving behind the supermarkets. They have plenty of good food there. And this is a man who can afford his groceries. This is not a man who needs to be dumpster diving for survival. He just seems to be unable to pass up free stuff. And he also seems to hate spending money. So basically he would just, get everything he could for the best deal ever and he would still scavenge his food from dumpsters. All of that aside, he tells police that yes, actually he did spend 15 years with Patricia and she left him for Pompon and actually she left him in the worst way possible because he was ill in the hospital when she decided to basically take off, but she didn't take off empty handed. He's like, I'm glad you're here actually, let me bring this up because she stole all of my savings a bunch of CDs and a bunch of VHS tapes, which if it's similar to, you know, the shampoo bottles he's got on his shelves is probably hundreds of CDs and hundreds of VHS tapes, as well as jewelry. And police are like, all oh, right, that's awful. Well, how much did she take? And he said, well, I used to save all of my money in cash in a plastic bag under the sink. And I had 680,000 euros. <laughs> and police are like, okay, good one. And they didn't believe him, but he had actually reported the theft. The theft had happened a year and a half prior to Christian's murder in terms of timeline. And he had reported to the local police, but police were like, well, where's the money coming from? What is it doing under your sink? Why aren't you putting it in a bank? And he never could really answer the question. Um, I do believe the money came from mostly inheritance. I don't know why it was in cash, but a lot of it also belonged to his brother. And because Patricia had stolen the money, it was also his brother's money. So it basically the brother stopped speaking to Claude because 
he had lost his money as well. So basically, Claude Clément explains to police that Patricia had stolen all of this money, CDs, VHS tapes, as well as jewelry with Pompon from him, and no one was looking into this, and he wanted his money back. So police are like, right, okay. Again, they don't really believe him with the robbery because they also just genuinely can't believe someone would stash almost 700,000 euros in plastic bags under the sink. But the reason he knew exactly how much was in those bags was because he would count it repeatedly. Like almost like an OCD thing and I don't want to mislabel anything, but he would basically open the bags, count the money, count the money, count the money, close it, put it back under the sink, and he would constantly count the money again and again. It's not like he was spending it. It's not like he wanted to invest it. I think he was just a bit of a hoarder, but in a, a very different way. Like just with money, he just wanted a little pile of cash that he could count every day. So he knew exactly how much money was there. And police are just like looking at this guy and they're like, what a bit of an oddball, right? Like this man, is dumpster diving. He has a stupid, well, he had a stupid amount of money, allegedly, and he's just not fitting the profile. They just don't know what to make of it. The man lived 500 kilometers away from the crime scene, and he didn't seem to have any motive against Christian anyway. So police quickly dismiss him and actually still don't really look into the robbery because they're like, right, okay, we're not gonna waste our time with this. We're trying to solve a murder here. So that means police has eliminated every single one of Patricia's exes as suspects. And now they just don't really know where to look anymore, but they decide to go back to the list, the blacklist they were working on because everything had come back clear, but they found out about Ahmed Ghazali. Back in 1994, Ahmed had stabbed a nightclub bouncer to death. And Mohamed, the nightclub bouncer, actually happened to work for Christian. Unfortunately, Mohamed died as a result of the stab wounds and Christian decided to get involved in this. He tried to do everything he could to make it right. He ended up paying for the entire funeral cost, but he also paid for Mohamed's body to be sent back to Algeria, his home country. But he also offered the family his own personal lawyer, so one of the best lawyers, to fight Ahmed in court to prosecute him. This meant that Ahmed stood zero chances in court and he also, so Christian, also came to the scene recreation, so the reenactment. Christian showed up for that because he wanted to see Ahmed and he also wanted to be there for Mohammed's family even though he was just an employee. He cared a lot about his company and his employees. So he showed up at the scene recreation and Ahmed was furious because he knew Christian was the one to provide the lawyer. He knew he didn't stand a chance. So he started, he started shouting at Christian saying, what are you doing here? You're pissing me off. You shouldn't even be here. I'm gonna come after you. I'm gonna kill you. I'm gonna kill your family. He started threatening him, which is like the worst thing you could do, but he just went for it and ended up going to jail for six years, but got released in 2000. So police thought, well, perfect. This guy's finally out of jail. And although it's been four years, he's probably thinking, let me get back at this guy as well, because he's the one who put me in jail. And it seemed like a very good lead. However, Ahmed had one of the most solid alibis, so he was quickly eliminated, which was such a bummer because that would make so much sense. And police were now back to square one. They weren't getting very far with the case, but a month and a half later on Valentine's Day, police received a phone call from the forensics team and they're saying, hey, remember the black glove you found behind Christian's car? We actually have a DNA match. And the reason they had a DNA match was because police actually I love when this happens. Police had the foresight to take DNA from every single person they interviewed or interrogated. So any person they've spoken to, they would grab a DNA sample and be like, perfect, we've got this. So in case we need to compare it to anything, we can rule you guys out or get a match. And it was a match. It was a match to a male DNA and police couldn't believe whose name popped up. Forensics informed police that the glove belonged to Claude Clément, the dumpster diving cheapskate who lived 500 kilometers away from the crime scene. And the police can't believe it. They've met the guy. They're like, this is, there's absolutely no way this is him. There has to be a reasonable explanation. And as they made their way to his house again to arrest him, the police officer who was cuffing him 
was actually doubting himself. He's like, there's no way this is him. I can't believe we're arresting this guy. Like, there's no way this guy shot anyone. And Claude had an alibi. On December 23rd, he had gone to Toulon to check out the Christmas decorations and on the way back got stuck in the worst traffic jam ever. And he remembered it vividly. He said, look, there was a car crash and it was really bad. He described the entire scene and said he had been stuck in that traffic for hours and Toulon is quite far from Toulouse, even though the names look similar, they're quite far away. So there's absolutely no way he could have gotten there and back. And police know from the way he's describing the traffic jam, they, they know he was definitely in that traffic jam, but there had to be an explanation. So they keep asking him questions and Claude Clément's like, actually, you know what, guys, I'm really not interested in your murder questions because I didn't do this. But hey, let's talk about that dang robbery because where's my money? I want my money back and no one's talking about this. You guys should be looking for my money and not asking me questions about a murder I didn't commit. So yeah, he was actually getting very upset because where was his justice? No one was taking him seriously aside from like they didn't believe him for the robbery but they believed he could have committed murder and that was just very frustrating for Claude. So instead police decide to whip out the glove and say well explain this then because we found your glove at the crime scene and we know it's yours your, your DNA is in it and like he had the funniest reaction because he saw the glove and he's like what you found my glove i can't believe this where was this like i've been looking for it for ages and you know Claude Clément's not the type of person to misplace anything or be happy to replace something i'm sure he was quite upset that he was missing a glove and police are like well funny story this was behind the car at the crime scene and he's like oh my god patricia and pompon stole the gloves from me and they planted it at the scene it's them they're trying to frame me they killed christian blah 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 and police are like well actually they both have very solid alibis so there's absolutely no way it's them and if it's not them then how did your glove get there because you're saying they're the ones who stole it from you and he's like i'm getting framed it isn't me he's just obviously trying to convince police that he had nothing to do with this crime scene. So police are like, right, okay, cool. We'll put him in custody until he answers some of our questions. So as they're bringing him to his cell, he's like, good one, guys, this is really realistic. Like, this is fun, but like, where are we going? And the police officers are like, well, you're gonna stay in a cell. He's like, but really though, where am I going? And they're like, in a cell, you're staying in prison for now. So as the police officer was closing the cell door, he's like, this is a prank, right? Like, what are you doing? And he just like, he just didn't seem to have the right, um, um, what's the word? Like, he just couldn't comprehend that this wasn't a joke. So he's just think, oh, right, this is the funniest prank, but let me out. And police are like, no, you're, you know, you're under arrest on suspicion of the murder of Chris Christian Lebuis. And he's like, what are you talking about? Like, why could, how could you put me in jail when I haven't done anything? And he couldn't understand that. And just police were so confused. They just could not understand what was going on. Now, because they do believe he is involved to a certain extent, um, they definitely think that he has something to do with this. After all, his glove ended up at the crime scene. Police decide to look into the robbery and see if there's any truth to that. So they bring Patricia into questioning and start asking her and the second they start asking questions she just broke down she she just completely confessed she said yeah i stole the money i stole everything i stole the jewelry um Pompon was there however he was just there he didn't steal anything he was just with me so she left him out of this she met him when she was 25 and he was 16 years older which is quite a big age gap and she spent 15 years with him and over the years he would kind of chip away at her self-esteem. He would be very mentally, emotionally, verbally abusive and he would basically just kind of tear her down over and over again and throughout the years to the point where 15 years later she met Pompon, fell in love with him and she's like, great, let me just get out of this terrible relationship. And she felt like she was, this was payback. She would just grab everything she could and leave. And she did tell police, she's like, look, that night we grabbed a hotel room to count the money and the stuff I'd stolen. And it was 107,000 euros, which is a very, very, very different number from the one Claude had given. There's like 600,000 missing there. She said this, the, she felt like stealing from him was just payback and police did 
think of the fact that if they had been married, technically it wouldn't have been theft because you can't really steal from a spouse. However, they weren't married and it was still theft, but she immediately confessed to it. She ended up going to jail for a year for it. Um, Pompon was left out of it, unfortunately. However, the least thing that this could be the cause for motive. Basically, Patricia took something from Claude that he was really attached to. It's like he, he loved that money, that little like stash of cash he had under his sink, he would count it over and over again. So when she took that from him, I don't think he was too upset about the CDs and the VHS tapes, but she took that from him, he, it made him physically sick. He lost a hundred pounds after that. That's a huge weight loss, like that's insane. He, that's how sick he was from the robbery is because she stole something from him. It's kind of like, imagine if like a hoarder has all this stuff in the house and you come in and you just start throwing stuff away. That's not how it works. It will affect them severely. So police are thinking, well, this could be motive. He's trying to get back to Patricia, but instead of taking his anger out or frustration out on Patricia, he aimed for the father. Either way, police need to figure out how Claude had gotten his hands on those guns because this is France. You can't just, I mean, you can buy guns, but there's a lot of paperwork involved and there was absolutely no trace of, you know, these guns getting sold and police couldn't find the guns. They had no idea where the guns were. So they decide to look through the um, phone calls he had been receiving, the, the two calls a month he got on his landline. And that's when they hear of Richard Cormelie, who was a childhood friend of Claude's brother. Richard had been Claude's brother's best friend growing up and then they kind of lost they kind of lost touch for 30 years and then out of nowhere Claude called Richard and Richard actually had been the gun guy in the region they lived in the same town and Richard was you know knew everything there was to know about guns he had a lot of guns he was passionate about guns he had a license to carry and a license to shoot he would go to the shooting range quite a lot he wasn't like a an obsessed junkie or anything he just really loved guns. So Claude thought, oh, this is perfect. Let me get in touch with this guy. So the police brought Richard in to ask about the guns and to see what Claude asked him for. Richard told police that Claude came over one day and said, hey, you know what? I've got some pigeons in my backyard that I can't wait to get rid of. Do you know someone who knows someone who has a gun? And Richard's like, I know plenty of people who can get you a gun. So he gave the name of someone who could get clothed some guns and that was it. So Rich is like, look, I was just the point of contact. However, a little bit later, Claude came back to Richard to say, hey, can you take me to the shooting range and help, help me practice? So basically help me get better at handling these guns. I have no idea what I'm doing. So that happened. And then a little while later, Claude came by Richard's house with a bag and the bag had both guns in it. He basically told Richard, hey, so these are the guns I asked you for. I don't really need them anymore. Richard didn't really ask any questions. And he's like, here are the guns. I don't want them, but I know you like guns. So maybe you want to keep them. And Richard told police that he had a nephew who was a hunter. So he thought, perfect, I'll just give the guns to my nephew, the hunter. So police obviously couldn't find the guns in Richard's house. They did search Richard's house and what they found was, they found rooms and rooms of guns. Like this guy had an armory and like he had so many guns, police couldn't believe it. He's like, they have, this guy has more guns than our police department. This is just insane. However, none of the guns were the ones that Claude or whoever was at the crime scene had used. So they asked Richard and Richard said, yeah, so the bag, I gave that to my nephew. However, police found out that he had only given the bag to his nephew once he found out that police were looking to speak to him. So I think he knew something had happened with those guns and police definitely believed that Richard was involved. So they try asking Claude about this and Claude's like, what is this guy on? This guy's on crack, this guy's an alcoholic. I have no time for, <laughs> for alcoholics. They're a waste of space. He never gave me any contacts. He never gave me the guns. I got them myself. And he's just denying the whole story. So then Richard's thinking like, damn, I could have just lied and said, I don't know about nothing. Because, Paul, uh, because Claude is just basically telling police that this guy has nothing to do with the guns or the story. They tried to put them in the room together, see if confrontation will help. However, Claude just absolutely lost it and started shouting at him and started just, I don't know, just swearing at Richard and telling police that this man has nothing to do with him. 
So just, you know, stop lying, calling everyone a liar, basically. He was just losing the plot. So police are like, right. Kept Richard in custody for a little while, just until they could figure out just how involved Richard was in this case. Meanwhile, Chloe's most recent partner came to police to say, hey, by the way, I have seen him put the guns in an orange box. I have seen the guns, though they're no longer in the house. I know he had the guns. So that's already incriminating enough. Now they have confirmation that both guns were in Claude's possession. And the, the reason the ex-partner was coming forward to police was because he was threatening her. And she told police, she's like, actually, one time he took me up to Nayu, which is where Christian lived, to do some recon. He wanted to walk around and he basically wanted to confront Christian because he couldn't get through to Patricia. He wanted his money back and police weren't taking him seriously. So he thought, you know what, let me speak to her dad. And so he's going around this small town now. Christian Labouis is famous throughout France or in the region. And he goes to that little home, like little village. Obviously everyone in the village knows of Christian. And when he's asking around being like, hey, y'all know where he's at. People are like, yeah, like we know where he lives, but you can't just show up at his house, especially because Claude was quite riled up. So all the villagers are like, you might want to pipe down before you confront Christian because he will kill you or he will beat you up. So maybe tone it down a little bit. He's like, cool, 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 cool. Figured out where Christian lived. He's like, nah, let's just go home. So they went back home and police are like, right, okay, so this guy's definitely done it. They confront him about the ex's story and he's like, what? I can't believe this, she's lying. He just starts gaslighting the police. He starts gaslighting Natalie, his ex, but he's starting to crack. So police are slowly starting to see him kind of break down. To the point where Claude finally admitted to police that on December 23rd, 2004, he had had enough. He'd spent a year and a half stewing, like basically seething because no one was taking his robbery seriously. He was missing his money. He wanted his money back and Patricia wouldn't even answer his calls. So he was actually losing sleep over this. And on December 23rd, he finally snapped. He loaded the guns, put the guns in the car, made his way to Christian's house and decided to wait for him outside his gate, his front gate. And when Christian came home, Claude allegedly went up to Christian's car, knocked on his window and say, hey, remember me? I would like my money back. Your daughter stole from me. And Christian's like, right, good one. Get the fuck out of here before I beat you up. Leave me alone thinking, you know, like, stop bothering me, you're not getting anything back, got back into his car. I forgot to say, Christian got out of the car to speak to Claude. Got back into his car, and that's when Claude walked away, grabbed the shotgun, and shot at Christian through the window. We know the series of events that follow until Christian is lying in his driveway, and Claude insisted that he was the only shooter. He had both guns on him, and it would explain why there was so many, um, there was so much ammunition left behind us because he, he, he didn't think of picking it up. But to be honest, he was probably in an altered state of mind. He was just like raging when this was happening. He wasn't thinking of like covering up the crime scene. So basically he shot Christian to death and decided to get back in his car and drive back home, which is quite a long drive, a couple of hours. And on the drive home, he was so distracted and so distraught that he missed the exit. So he ended up having to turn around and that's how he ended up stuck in that traffic jam. And that's why he was so good at telling police what the traffic looked like because he was actually stuck in that traffic jam. And he kept Richard out of the case. He said Richard had nothing to do with this aside from providing him a name to get the guns from, someone to get the guns from. So police eliminated Richard from the entire case and released him. The expert definitely don't believe he acted alone just because when they recreated the scene, the angles weren't really adding up. A lot of the stuff wasn't really sticking, but Claude Clement is a bit of a character. He's a bit of an oddball and he think, police, police think he was very nervous, obviously during the reenactment to the point where, where he was trying to reload the gun to show them he had to have police help him out because he couldn't do it. So some people think it's because he's genuinely so bad he has no idea how to do it or police think that he could have been just incredibly nervous doing this in front of police because again, this is not a person who's like a serial killer who likes to kill people. This was more of like heat of the moment and it was purely emotional. 
Patricia ended up pleading guilty to the robbery. As I said, she spent a year in jail and she had to pay the money back. And the jury ended up agreeing on a total sum of 174,000 euros. And, and Claude was furious about this. First of all, because he's like, that's not even close to what she stole from me, but also because he would never see the money again. The money went back to the Labuis family in damages. So he got robbed twice, basically. He never got the money back. And even if he had, it wouldn't even be close to the amount he was claiming. On July 3rd, 2008, Claude Pnemel's court case started and it didn't take very long for the jury to find him guilty. And he was sentenced to 16 years. And that was such a shocking outcome that even the defense team was like, what? Do you mean <laughs> like it was too short they couldn't believe that that was the verdict and the prosecution team appealed immediately and a couple of years later he got resentenced and this time it got 25 years which is a bit of a more fitting time to spend in jail for murder so he is still in jail to this day what's so awful is that patricia feels very responsible for what happened to her father because her actions led to Claude Clément murdering him, even though she didn't make Claude Clément murder him. That is what ended up happening. And that's what's so devastating about this case is that Patricia is a victim as well. She got ditched by her dad who couldn't even be bothered to tell her that the mother was dead. He just dropped her off at the end, just moved on with his life, married someone else, started a new family, barely acknowledged her. So I don't really blame Patricia for anything. I, I know her actions had severe consequences, but ultimately, Claude Clément was the one who decided to come up to Christian's house with two guns. Now, the defense team insisted that the reason why Claude brought two guns with him is because he was genuinely terrified of Christian, which anyone would. He is a terrifying guy. I mean, the guy works in security and surveillance. He was an ex-commando, ex-mercenary. However, you don't really bring a gun to a knife fight. So at the end of the day, it makes no difference what his intent was he ended up killing someone. Then again, I think it's important to highlight that he got back to, he got back at Patricia exactly the same way she got back at him. So she stole what was most important to him, his money. He was so, so, so attached to that money that his payback was quite interesting because instead of being so mad at Patricia that he ended up killing her, he ended up taking away the most important part of her life, the only family she had left. She was dying to get closer to her father. She wanted a relationship with him. She wanted the father she never had, and he took that away from her. So I think it's quite interesting that that's how it turned out. You would expect him to go after Patricia, not her father. But overall, it's just such a tragic story all around. Like nobody won in this entire story. Anyway, that is it for today's video, guys. I hope the audio worked this time. <laughs> I hope the audio worked this time. Um, otherwise, I might cry. I might give up my channel. I hope you liked this. Let me know what you thought of this story. Um, do you know what? Claude Clément reminds me of... Claude Clément reminds me of the guy from Office Space, the guy with the staple, he's like, excuse me, who just ends up burning the whole place down. Working out. <laughs> Go ahead and get that from you. <laughs> okay. I set the building on fire. And that's the kind of vibe I get from him. Um, not to defend him. I don't personally, I don't think he's like a bad person or anything. I don't think he had an evil side to him. I think he genuinely snapped. Like I think he has some mental health issues as well. Um, just from the way he kind of lives his life. That, you know, when he got robbed a significant amount of money lost his relationship with his brother because of the robbery, lost a lot of stuff because of the money gone, and no one took him seriously. <laughs> like, I'm not saying I understand, but I definitely think that it's not just straight up revenge. I think he, he just straight up snapped. But anyway, let me know what you think of this case. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this, please like and subscribe, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.